Hi guys, I'm here today to talk to you about a book that I have fallen in love with, one I knew I would fall in love with, and that is Winter by Ali Smith. If you have been around here for any amount of time, you will know that I love Ali Smith's works. I've talked about all of her books in an author spotlight video, which I'll link down below. Last year I talked about all of my thoughts on Autumn, well some of my thoughts, not all of them, quite a lot of my thoughts on Autumn, which is the first in her new quartet series. Winter is the second book in that series. However, you do not need to have read Autumn to read Winter because they're only loosely linked character-wise, but they are very strongly linked thematically because they are books that discuss the present and um, political situations in the UK, but through fiction. It's not a novel that is specifically about Brexit, it just reflects the feelings and everything that's going on at the moment, um, and I'll get more into that in a second. But today I want to talk about my thoughts on winter, and Ali Smith I find is not really an author whose books you can spoil because they are not driven specifically by plot um, and you can talk about the themes in them without ruining the book because everyone is going to get so so many different things from this book so I want to talk about some of my immediate thoughts without focusing too much on the actual plot of the book to give you a taster um, and, and some of the things that this book really made me consider and feel in the hope that you might want to go and check it out and I'll leave a link to the book along with a link to Autumn um, and my video about Autumn in the description box down below. I highly recommend checking out Ali Smith's works. I just think, I just think that she's a little bit brilliant. This book begins with a list of things that are dead. God was dead to begin with and that is actually a reference to A Christmas Carol. Marley was dead to begin with um, and Ali Smith started Autumn as well with a, a, a changed quote from Dickens. She began with Tale of Two Cities. It was the worst of times it was the worst of times, no best of times, it was just, it was just pretty bad. It was the worst of times, it was the worst of times. So she's done that again here um, to show how literature is all linked and how novels don't exist on their own and they're always a reflection of what has come before and she really plays with that idea of, of, of past and present and what informs those things throughout the whole book. So the first section of the book, as I said, is a list of things that are dead according to Google. God was dead, Art was dead. Whereas Autumn was a discussion of a change in the air on the run-up to the EU referendum in the UK, now we're moving into winter. This is the non-time, this is the frozen time, the static time, um, the mind the gap time, and we're going to talk about more about gaps in a little bit. But this is where the country is static, where no one really knows how to move forward, where people are waiting for the thaw, for something, anything, to happen. It's this frozen state like Narnia. Um, and thinking of winter isn't just a case of, of snow, real life snow outside, but think about snow on your television as well. Think about being stuck between two channels when the communications fail and all you're left with is white noise. That's where we are. It isn't just a case that the country is static, it's also the characters too. They're stuck in this non-time where they can't really progress very far and um, because they're always thinking about what's happened and, and being weighted down by the past. So those first few lines are a real play on words, tongue in cheek. God was dead to begin with, Art was dead. There are two characters in this book called Arthur, Art, and Godfrey, God. God was dead and Art is dead. They are, they are frozen in time. Ali Smith really loves her play on words like that and it's really, it's a pleasure to read and given that the subject matter can be quite heavy in places, having those little giggles is always appreciated. The first character that we're introduced to is called Sophia Cleave and Cleave obviously means to sever or to cut and we're introduced to Sophia as she is talking to a severed head like Hamlet, reflecting on death um, and on destruction and musing on, on the past. Um, but she's also talking to this severed head that only she can see, nobody else can see it. This severed head seems to represent many different things, one of which is art and massacre, something that Sophia focuses on quite a lot at the beginning part of this book. Um, there's also a reference to Paddington as well, because why wouldn't you need a reference to Paddington? Please look after this head, just like please look after this bear. And what is Paddington? Paddington is a refugee. And that is also what Sophia is thinking about. She's thinking about the refugee crisis. She thinks that no one else is being paying attention to it and she's the only person who can see it, except she can't really see properly because the severed head that she's talking to is actually a manifestation of this problem with her vision that she's had, something that she's been ignoring for ages in the back of her head, thinking she can actually see quite clearly, thank you very much. And 
then she realizes that actually her eyesight is fractured and she can't see because there's something clouding her vision, something that she's been ignoring for a very long time. What things in life do we ignore for so long until they're so very present we can't ignore them any longer? I think we can think of quite a large list. Um, and Sophia, who's been ignoring all of these things for so long and now has her eyesight affected, is um, contrasted with her sister, who has always been very politically active, who is called Iris, because Iris can see. There's a lot of wordplay in this. Sophia keeps on saying, that remains to be seen and I see. And then at one point she holds her head in her hands. Um, it, it's, it's asking the reader to question our own reality, what we choose to believe and um, with Sophia with this fake head. What do we think is fake, playing into polit political rhetoric? What, what do we believe to be true? Interestingly, in this book, at least in the beginning, and this changes as time goes on, the past is written in the present and the present is written in the past tense. Presumably because the past is present in everything we do and our present is influenced by everything we've done before. Now you might think that that's really confusing to read, but in actual fact it's not and I really enjoyed that. So that is Sophia. Then we have Art. Art is Sophia's son and he is coming home for Christmas. Art is a pretentious blogger who talks about nature. He's really obsessed with his online presence. He feels that his online presence is more real than his actual presence, um, which makes for amusing reading when his girlfriend Charlotte or ex-girlfriend Charlotte then hacks his online account and pretends to be him and he has an existential crisis. Um, Art is like an immodest Jesus. He is obsessed with the number of followers that he has. And his mother says at one point, Christ, that's the last thing I need. And she's actually talking about something else, but I like that double meaning there, Christ that's the last thing that I need. Jesus himself, of course, was a refugee. So we have this Christmas story, the first Christmas story, and then we have um, stories of other Christmases after that, such as A Christmas Carol, and then this present story of our present Christmas, layered. So we have this layered, almost like snow, and how um, all these layers have compacted together. Um, we also have this image of snowballing later when we're talking about political protests as an actual act of political protest called snowballing. So anyway, how these stories have snowballed together to create this huge narrative. And Art on his blog writes about nature um, and he pretends that he isn't influenced by anything else that he reads ever and everything he writes is very organic, thank you very much, even though we can see inside his head in this book and all the things he's noting down and thinking I'm going to use that myself later. And Ali Smith is obviously saying that literature should feed and absorb like osmosis and contain lots of other stories but that writers should really admit to that because it's a good thing whereas art won't admit to that and he thinks that that he's godlike, actually. So Art writes about nature. His girlfriend Charlotte says she, he should be more interested in politics and write about that. Um, Art says, I can never write about politics. I write about hedgerows and hedgerows are never political. Um, she then laughs in his face, presumably because hedgerows are borders. Charlotte then leaves him. This is at the very beginning of the book. Charlotte leaves him and Art really wants to take someone home for Christmas. He doesn't have Charlotte anymore. She has gone off and stolen his online persona. So he decides he's gonna hire someone to be Charlotte. This woman he finds called Lux. Now, this is something that Ali Smith does in several of her novels where she has a woman coming in who is named after a form of light, um, such as Amber in The Accidental, who, who pretends to be someone else and helps fractured families come together. It also happens in The Seer as well. Um, now, some people might think that that is a recycling of plot. It's, I really don't think it is. Ali Smith just comes back to themes that she finds really, really interesting and she, she layers, as we were talking about before, she layers those narratives, she snowballs them, she comes back and she adds to it. And I find that so fascinating to follow. I just, I personally love it. So Art hires this woman called Lux to come home and meet his mother and pretend to be Charlotte. Um, and when Art and Lux meet each other, they are so disconnected. Um, and that disconnection is shown by, the, by Ali Smith having all of Art's dialogue on one page and then 
all of Lux's dialogue on the next page. So you have to read the conversation separately and then piece it together. And I just thought that was really fun. Essentially, this book is all about performance. Lux is pretending to be Charlotte. Art is pretending to be um, a writer who comes up with all of these ideas. Um, Sophia is pretending that she can't see these things um, when her family come in that she thinks she could actually see. Um, she's also rewritten parts of her past and lied to her family. Um, it's all about these layers of performance. Um, and and how you can trick yourself into believing certain things if you've lied to yourself for long enough um, and then there's reference to um, mistaken identities in this book so obviously Lux is a mistaken identity and then Charlotte has taken Art's online identity there is a reference in this book to National Velvet which is a film about a girl who dresses up as a boy so she can take part in the Grand National which is rather Shakespearean which is fitting because there are elements of Cymbeline in this book Two. I'm going to read you this quote. It says, his mother stops speaking and starts humming a tune, and Art knows the doors of reminiscence have closed, as surely as if she reminiscence is a cinema or a theatre, and the show is over, the rows of seats empty, and the audience have gone home. Um, and this harks back to The Accidental, where Amber, who is the character of Lux, the equivalent of the character of Lux, um, feels like she's born out of cinema, out of these, these films, these recreated memories, and that's the point um, that's being made here, that memory is a film, that memory is an unreliable narrator, it's like, it's like political propaganda that you have fed to yourself. There are images of fakeness throughout this, putting fake grass on a lawn. Um, Art says his grandfather in the coffin looked waxy and unreal. So politics, war, refugees, fractured countries, fractured eyesight, fractured families. This novel discusses all of those things, reoccurring dreams, reoccurring nightmares, things in the past that come back to haunt us, not just people but political situations. And at the heart of this, Sophia is sitting in her home saying that they can't stay with her because actually she has no room, even though she really does. Um, I could talk for a very long time about this book, um, but I would like you to go and read it and discover it for yourselves and have an explosion of thoughts because that is what books by Ali Smith make you have, explosions of thoughts. But I'm going to read you this little quote here. It's like the people in the play are living in the same world, but separately from each other. Like their worlds have somehow become disjointed or broken off each other's worlds. But if they could just step out of themselves, or just hear and see what's happening right next to their ears and eyes, they see it's the same play they're all in, the same world, and they're all part of the same story. I found this book really, really, I can't speak, I found this book very, very moving. Um, and I actually read it when I was away for a couple of days in the middle of a forest, in this house, feeling quite isolated, almost like the house that that they go to. It's a house um, which is called, oh, the House of the Mind, but in Cornish. Um, I, I'd gone to this separate space and devoured this book. And as I said, there's a, a, a thread that runs throughout this of the first Christmas of, of Jesus being born and there's references to Away in a Manger. And as I finished reading this book, Away in a Manger came on the radio. Um, I think it was on Classic FM or something. And I just had this really, it's, it's just, it sent shivers down my spine. It was like, the world, I know, I know this sounds really cheesy, but it was like the world knew I was reading this book um, and then the book kind of crept in to my life, which is, which is exactly what this book is because it is a, a mixture of fiction and non-fiction and makes you think about um, our current world. But it was, it was so, I don't know, it really gave me the shivers. Um, anyway. I, I, I love this book. I'm going to leave a link to it down below if you would like to go and find out more. I would love to know what you thought of the book, if you've read it, um, and if you're unsure of where to start with Ellie Smith's books. As I said, um, I made an author spotlight where I talked about all of her books, which I'll link in the description box down below. I adored it, and safe to say, this is one of my favourite books of 2017, and I hope that if you decide to check it out, that you love it too. I hope you guys are having a great week, and I'll speak to you very soon. Lots of bookish love. Bye.